Oh well. Somehow I've made it this far into my channel without talking about video games, which really surprised me since video games are one of my favorite mediums of storytelling. They allow you to explore these fantastic worlds with these larger-than-life characters to present a narrative that gives you more control than other types do. Think about it, with most movies, all you do is sit and watch, and while this is super entertaining, especially if you're a big movie nerd like myself, there's something really compelling about being able to actually take control in that situation and dictate what you do. It can allow the player to feel like they're truly there, and more so that their actions actually have consequences to the outcome of the story. And I think this is what makes video games compelling to so many, including myself, is that it is a different way to experience a story. And while this feeling of immersion can apply to any type of game, I feel that one genre that it is the most prevalent in is that of horror. In a horror game, you are usually the one at fault if something is to go wrong. Because of this, your actions have consequences, as they likely wouldn't if you're watching a movie, as whatever's going to happen there is going to happen regardless of your input. Unless you're watching, like, an interactive movie, but we're, we're just talking about, like, normal movies that you watch. And sure, in a lot of horror games, the jump scares are scripted to happen at a certain point in the story, or a certain point in gameplay, or something along those lines. But a lot of times, whatever happens to you is a direct result of you doing something wrong. However, jump scares aren't all that pertain to horror. In fact, most of the horror games I enjoy aren't all that heavy on jump scares, but instead on telling a narrative. What makes horror unique as a genre is often the characters associated with it and the different things that they are going through. Take the Silent Hill games, for example. They portray trauma and fears that are personal to the individual that you're playing as. Because of this, even though you might not have the same fears or past experiences as your character, you can relate to them more because you can see what it is they're going through and what it is that has brought them to this point based on what they are afraid of and the beasts that are haunting them. And this is the case in many horror games, including the subject of today's video, The Floor is Breathing. The Floor is Breathing is a relatively quick game. You can finish it in about 20 minutes or less if you're trying to. This game deals with things such as psychosis and paranoia in such an interesting and unique way that I haven't seen before. And it is because of this game's unique presentation that after playing it, I knew I wanted to make a video on it. The floor is breathing begins with a VHS style cutscene playing. Text appears in place of the dialogue reading, and so you understand what we found. The recipient stays quiet, though an image of a woman appears. She is wearing an orange jumpsuit, allowing us to infer that this isn't just a normal interview, but one between a prisoner and a law enforcement officer of some kind. Her face is gaunt and appears to be covered in scars. The officer continues, pushing past her lack of a response and revealing what was found. Four mutilated corpses inside of your home. Finally, the woman responds. I like the feel of their breath through the floorboards. The cutscene fades out to reveal more text, though this time it's a date. January 17th, 2007. 7.36 p.m. Welcome home. It's simple enough. You use WASD to walk and move your character, and the mouse to look around. Pretty standard things for a computer game. You click on the left mouse to interact with certain objects. But in the bottom right screen, we can see that pressing E allows us to check our tasks. Completing these tasks is the core objective throughout the game, as the player must do so before they are able to progress to the next day. So, pressing E reveals our to-do list for this day. Check for monsters under the bed. Use my hammer to fix the window. Watch the TV. And lastly, go to sleep. The bedroom is located up the stairs and down the hallway to the right. Walking up there we can see that, thankfully, there are no monsters under the bed. So we can check that off of our list. The next item is to fix the window with the hammer, which is, conveniently, placed in a seat right next to our bed. So we pick it up and head downstairs again to the front door. Approaching it, we can see that the window on the bottom left is in fact broken. Using a plank of wood, we board up the window, crossing that off our list as well. Next up, we head into the living room to watch some TV, though on the way I noticed a newspaper on the table. The newspaper reads, Divorce rates at highest. Lose yourself in the dream. Reality is cold. You and me both know 
that hiding in yourself is the only way to sustain your sick fantasies. You can't hide. The drugs and drink can never flush out your guilt. It is all your fault. Everything that happens to you is deserved. You are vile. A loss of a single life, possibly more, is simple ammunition in your war for freedom and pleasure. Broadcast it. Let the world enjoy euphoria with you. Getting close to the TV, it turns on by itself without a scene to do anything. But what it shows us is four faces, repeating on loop, all of which have an uncanny nature to them. They look deceased, though their eyes remain open, staring at the player as they watch back. At this point, though, all that's left to do is go to bed. So I made my way back upstairs and back to the bedroom, but on my way I noticed something that wasn't there before. There was something under the bed, and it appears to be a bloodied tarp. But with there being nothing for me to do to interact with it, I simply have no other choice but to go to sleep. This triggers another cutscene that resembles a VHS tape. It shows the four faces that we saw on the television just moments before. The song Five Little Ducks went swimming one day, playing in the background, though the starting number being four instead of the usual five. I can't play this music due to copyright issues, but as it continues, a face of some sort appears in the background behind them as the face on the far left disappears. The scene fades out as text appears again. January 18th, 2007, 8.21 p.m. Welcome home. The first thing I did this day was check my tasks. The daily tasks really don't change as the days progress, at least as far as gameplay is concerned. You'll pretty well be doing the same thing over and over again. Today they say, check if the window is safe, check for monsters under my bed, watch the TV, and go to sleep. Walking up to the window, we can see that the board we put on the previous day has fallen down. Was someone trying to get in maybe? Either way, we put the plank back up and go about our day, checking for monsters under the bed. While the bloodied tarp that was there the night before is gone, there seems to be a pair of eyes staring back at us from under the bed. Regardless, this task too is crossed off the list, allowing us to go downstairs and watch more television. This time, instead of showing all four of the faces in a loop like it did last time though, it lingers on one. This is the same face that disappeared on the cutscene between the two days. After watching for a minute though, this happens. When we're finally able to see again, the house is different. There are nooses hanging from the ceiling, and all across the house there are various TVs that show the same face over and over again. Even the to-do list has changed. Checking on it, it says, January 23rd, 2007. Subject has various gross lesions across the chest and face, emerged bilaterally in the conjunction. The subject has rope burns around the neck and wrists. The subject has suffered the loss of three fingers. Subject was found hidden under the floorboards with three other individuals. After putting the note away and not knowing where else to go, I navigated my way through the house's new form and back up to the bedroom. Approaching the TV in there causes the face to appear in front of you. The following text accompanying it. Behold, the Lord came with many thousands of his holy ones to execute judgment upon all and to convict all the ungodly of all their ungodly deeds which they have done in an ungodly way, and of all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. And then, as suddenly as it had changed, the house is back to normal. Checking the list again, it says, go to sleep. And doing just that ends night two. There is another cutscene similar to the one the night before, though with the remaining faces. This time, just as it did previously, the face on the far left disappears, before fading in to the next day. January 19th, 2007, 7.56pm, 
welcome home. Our checklist for today is the same as the previous days. Repair the door, check for monsters under the bed, watch TV, and go to sleep. It is once again when we go to watch TV that the screen lingers on a face again. This time being the one that had disappeared the previous night. This time though, the house doesn't change. I sat for a moment waiting for something to happen like it did the previous night, but when I felt comfortable that nothing would, I headed back upstairs to go to sleep. Once I made it to the side of my bed, however, a phone started ringing. Walking downstairs reveals that the living room is now illuminated by the red light of the ringing phone. With nothing else to do, I walk up and answer it. I know what you've done. The floor begins rising and sinking once again, like it is taking a slow and deliberate breath of air. The face we saw that night is now illuminated on the TV screens that once again cover the house, this time accompanied by eyes as well, leaving the player in a constant state of being watched. Checking our to-do list reveals that it has changed to the following text. Dear Samantha, I'm writing to inform you that you're welcome to our New Year's party. I know you've been very isolated recently, but I think you'll make fast friends with the others. Also, pass on my best wishes to your husband. I haven't seen him for a few weeks. I hope he's doing well. Wishing you the best. Putting the to-do list away and going upstairs to the bedroom reveals a bag tied shut on the bed. Walking up to it gives the player the option, carry corpse. Picking it up and carrying it down the stairs presents the player with another change to the house. At the foot of the stairs is a hole, surrounded by eyes and the faces on the TV screen upon mannequin-like bodies. Looking down into the hole in the floor, we get the option to dispose of it. We can hear the sound of a shovel digging into the ground before the house returns to normal. <laughs> Checking our to-do list one last time for the day says tomorrow is another day. Only now we don't seem to be alone in the house. On the top of the stairs, there is a figure looking down at us. But when we walk up the stairs, he's nowhere to be found. Regardless, going to sleep triggers the same cutscene that we've seen between the other nights. Or, at least, it starts to. As it's interrupted by the sound of knocking. This wakes our protagonist up. The first thing I did was check my to-do list only to see one word written on it. Hide. Looking down the stairs, the figure is back, looking up at us. Trying to go down the stairs prompts the text, You are no longer safe here. Returning to the bedroom, there is suddenly a TV by the chair in our bed. Text appears to coincide with the appearance of the face in front of us. Then Elijah prayed and said, O oh Lord, please open his eyes so that he may see. So the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold. Turning around, we are faced with a door that had not previously been there. Walking through it, we are met with a long stretch of road. I tried to see what was on the other side of the door, yet again being faced with another eye. I tried to follow that way to see if there were any secrets, but sadly I was hit with an invisible wall that prohibited me from going further. So I headed back the way the game wanted me to go. After walking for a moment, a house can be seen on the left. Walking up to it sadly makes the player encounter yet another invisible wall. So, continuing further, a playground can be seen on the right side of the road near the house. We can see eyes once again floating around it, indicating that something bad is likely about to happen again. Getting closer, a message can be seen written in the grass. Open your eyes. There is a box sitting next to this message, with a note laying on top of it. To my dearest, Samantha, how is your husband? Though I suppose you wouldn't know, but I know. I saw what you've done, and I saw how you murdered your son too. You make my blood curl. Posting your vile actions online, creating a circus out of the death of your own flesh and blood. Deplorable filth. I have all of it. Recorded, saved, 
and so do the police. You will not escape your crime nor your judgment. Enjoy your eternal suffering, you sick, twisted <laughs> Putting down the note shows the change landscape. A red hue having taken it over. The note has switched to a TV with the man's face on it. The message on the ground has changed to say, finish what we started with a hammer next to it. Picking up the hammer and walking up to the TV, we destroy it. The face on it briefly changing to one of an agonized expression before the night ends. January 20th, 2007. 104 p.m. Recording start. Usually the days start with welcome home, but with this one saying recording start, something seems to be different. And we see this is very much the case when we spawn in. We're somewhere new, outside next to a car. Even our to-do list is different, now being a warrant instead. Warrant to enter and search premises. There's a bunch of legal information next to the photo of a woman. Underneath there's a handwritten note that says, Hey Mark, I don't know how I feel about this one. She should just be a witness, but something about her and this case makes me uncomfortable. Although she's lost her son and her husband, so go easy on her. I still insist you don't go alone, but I'm sure you'll still ignore me anyway. Be careful. Just ask the questions and check the house and get back. See you soon. Continuing down the trail, we come across a house. We ring the doorbell a few times, but no one answers. So, finally, we break down the door and enter. We are back in the same house we've been in the last few days. We are unable to go upstairs this time, but walking into the living room, we see that it is once again illuminated by a reddish light. It is from yet another face on the television. This time the television is shaking on the stand and facing the entrance. Turning around, we are faced with a woman. A smile is visible on her face as she stands in the darkness of the house, only illuminated by the light coming through the front door window. Approaching her leaves us in complete darkness. When we come to, we are strapped in a chair, the woman standing in front of us with cameras floating around our head in some strange room. After a moment, we seem to be attacked. Over and over again, all while the woman stares at us, the grin never leaving her face as we succumb to the darkness. But we still have one last day to go. January 20th, 2007, 9.57 p.m. You can't run forever. We once again start off in the house, though are instantly greeted by the sound of sirens and red and blue lights of police cars outside shining into the house. The silhouette of a person is visible through the front door. Checking our to-do list reveals one sentence. They can't take us alive. Going up to the room, the bedroom has been replaced by a table with a revolver laying atop it. Hovering over it prompts the text, Go to sleep. We are taken out of the darkness by recording playing one last time. The faces of the four men we saw each night are on the screen staring at us for several seconds before fading to normal images of the men. Text appears again as it did when we started the game, acting as a means to show conversation between seemingly a law enforcement agent and the woman. Four murders, and you couldn't even kill yourself. You're crowded by physical and digital evidence. She finally responds. The blood on my hands will stain your conscience into the, and before the last word can be finished. The sentence is cut off, bringing an end to the floor's breathing. So what exactly happened here? I'm sure most, if not all of you, have caught onto this already, but this game primarily has the player seeing the nightly routine of a serial killer as her delusions and paranoia related to the crimes that she has committed begin to haunt her, night to night, until her sins ultimately catch up to her. 
This is Samantha, the serial killer who we play as through the majority of the game. The four faces that we see throughout the game are Samantha's victims, and the game gives us just enough details to figure out who they are. For the most part, each night focuses on one of the victims, with the changing to-do list and other such items for us to view, allowing us to piece together who the victim was. For example, on the second night of hauntings, this face lingers on the TV and follows Samantha when the hauntings actually begin. This is the same night that the to-do list mentions that her husband has not been seen in quite some time. As is inferred by the letter on the playground, Samantha killed her husband along with her son. This allows us to infer that this face corresponds to Samantha's deceased husband. Speaking of the letter on the playground, I believe that this face, the one that corresponds with the night that we went to the playground, to be a neighbor or a friend of some sort. Someone close enough to see what Samantha had done and had enough proof to inform the cops, as well as write that letter to Samantha. This letter, of course, leads to the final victim being that of the police officer, a man named Mark, who was sent to Samantha's house in the only instance that we do not play as her. He shows up to the house and is attacked by her. This leads to one last victim remaining, the first victim of Samantha's. Well, as far as I could tell at least, there doesn't seem to be any evidence on the night of the haunting related to this victim. This victim almost has to be her son. The letter sent by the neighbor says that she killed her son too, and as all the other faces have a victim attached to them, that means that the first person she killed had to be her own son. With all the victims accounted for, we can look at the story chronologically. It seems as though Samantha has always struggled with keeping her violent tendencies in check, as seen through the newspaper, when it reads, You and me both know that hiding in yourself is the only way to sustain your sick fantasies. You can't hide. And I believe that the event that led to Samantha to act out on these fantasies and commit her crimes was a divorce with her husband. Given that this very same newspaper mentions divorce at the top, I don't think it's much of a stretch to assume that she and her husband were getting a divorce, and perhaps the husband was going to take their son with him when they separated, leading to her taking both of their lives in retaliation. Well, I could also see the argument that the desire for divorce could have been after the death of their son, I don't think the husband would find out about the death of their son and just want a divorce in response, but stranger things have happened. Either order could be possible, but I do believe that the divorce, at the very least, was directly responsible for the death of her husband, if not both he and the son. Either way, the son was killed first, followed shortly after by her husband. Regardless, Samantha gets some sick pleasure from not only taking their lives, but also filming their deaths and uploading them online for others to see. Once she is finished, she buries their bodies under the floorboards of her house. From this point on, Samantha's guilt at the murders begins to manifest itself as hallucinations throughout the house, seeing her victims' faces on the TV screens and the ways in which she has killed them. I believe that even little things about the house have changed given her hallucinations. For example, every single painting in the house seems to show someone dying in the electric chair, perhaps indicating her fear of being put to death if she is caught, or it is some part of her feeling guilty, suggesting that this is what she deserves for her crimes. On top of this, the biblical texts that appear seem to suggest punishment for Samantha. After all, it seems as though Samantha is somewhat split into two minds, as several texts throughout the game are plural when referring to her, such as finish what we started at the playground. Perhaps this is Samantha's darker side that has committed the crimes, as well as a side of Samantha that is guilty for what she's done. Regardless when these hallucinations begin, I feel as though they are just that, hallucinations, and not the spirits of her victims tormenting her from beyond the grave. Given the broken psyche and loose grip on reality that she seems to have when interacting with the police later on, saying things such as, I like the feeling of their breath through the floorboards. At some point in time, her neighbor becomes aware of what Samantha has done, somehow having come across the video of Samantha killing her own son and husband. 
He collects the evidence and sends it to the police, but not before writing a taunting letter to Samantha, informing her that he knows what she's done, and the police will soon catch her. This leads to Samantha taking his life as well. Soon after, a police officer named Mark is sent to Samantha's house. He breaks into the home after getting no response, but is quickly knocked out by Samantha, who proceeds to take his life and film him, just as she did the others. Mark's death and disappearance from the point of view to the rest of the police station send the police into action, who surround Samantha's house, leading her to attempt to take her own life as to not be apprehended by the police. Her attempt fails, though, and she is arrested, the story ending with her seemingly having no remorse for the atrocities that she has committed. And that was The Four is Breathing. I know this isn't the most groundbreaking of horror games, but there's something about this one that I just found particularly charming, mostly through its presentation of paranoia through like the TV screens and the floor literally breathing because there are bodies under it and she's like hallucinating them. But regardless, I just wanted to make a video on this because I really did enjoy the game. There will be a link in the description if you want to play it, and I'd highly implore you to do so as some idiot telling you about the game here on YouTube is a completely different experience from playing it yourself. But yeah, that is pretty well going to do it for today's video. I want to thank you all a ton for watching, as usual. Um, I know this was like the biggest break I've had between videos. Not that my upload schedule has ever been good, but it's never been this bad either, so I'm sorry, I just got super busy the last, like, two months. It's just been a, a very busy few months, and I apologize for that. I just haven't had time to work on these videos, um, but I'm going to try and do better with that, I promise. Um, as returning viewers can probably tell, we are in a brand new recording space from where we've been. Um, different building completely, but uh, yeah, I just I just appreciate you guys being patient with me And I, I promise I'll do better with my upload schedule going further um, Just while things are kind of settling down right now with life as it's it's still busy But it's slowing down enough for me to at least be able to do this so Hopefully we'll be able to get more uploads coming soon. My next video Should be a kind of longer one because I know this one wasn't too terribly long There won't be much to see with the next video. Unfortunately, it'll be very similar to my Ted the Caver video if you guys have seen that one, um, but it's one I'm really excited to make, and um, although there won't be like much media or anything like there was in this video, um, I'm just really excited to work on it and, and get that finished up, but yeah, just uh, thanks again for watching, guys. Uh, I appreciate it so much, and uh, I just hope you'll have a great day. Thanks.